The story of John D. Rockefeller transports us back to a time when industrial capitalism was raw and new in America and the rules of the game were unwritten. More than anyone else, Rockefeller incarnated the capitalist revolution that followed the Civil War and transformed American life. He embodied all of its virtues of thrift, self-reliance, hard work, and unflagging enterprise. Yet, as someone who flouted government and rode roughshod over competitors, he also personified many of its most egregious vices. As a result, his career became the focal point for a debate about the proper role in government in the economy that has lasted until the present day. John D. Rockefeller, an American industrialist, pushed the boundaries of commerce. Tragically, his competitive nature and greed led to the exploitation of small businesses. But in the end, did Rockefeller cause more harm or create a better world for all of us? My documentary will prove he did more good. John Davison Rockefeller was born July 8, 1839 to Eliza Davison Rockefeller and William Avery Rockefeller in Richford, New York. He was the second born but eldest son. Until he was 14 years old, the Rockefeller family lived on a farm in Rochester, New York and then relocated to Cleveland in 1853. John's mother, due to her Baptist upbringing, encouraged the children to donate a portion of their earnings to the church instilling a spirit of philanthropy on John. Shortly after the move, his father abandoned the family, causing John to drop school and get a job to provide for the family. Rockefeller's first job was an assistant bookkeeper at Hewitt & Tuttle Firm, making $300 a year. Rockefeller strived for more, and after saving enough money, he and a friend, Maurice Clark, formed a commissions office selling produce, meats, and other foodstuffs. On August 5, 1859, oil was struck in Titusville, Pennsylvania, causing prospectors to flood the western Pennsylvania countryside. Rockefeller saw prospecting as too risky. Refining the oil was a reliable moneymaker. Later, after some very profitable years, Rockefeller and Clark met Samuel Andrews, a chemist who was one of the discoverers of kerosene. Andrews, Clark, and Rockefeller set up their first refinery, named Andrews Clark and Company. turned out to be a success. However, Rockefeller always wanted to be the employer, not the employee, and did not like having to share ownership of the refinery with his partners. After many discussions, Rockefeller filed for dissolution with the Cleveland Leader newspaper and was to have the company's share it sold by auction among the trustees. Rockefeller recorded, I bid a thousand, the Clarks bid two thousand, and so on, little by little, the price went up, neither side willing to stop bidding. At last, the other side bid 72000 Without hesitation, I bid 72500 At that, Andrews, Clark & Company was dissolved. In its place, Rockefeller formed the Standard Oil Company in 1870. The Standard was now expanding rapidly and needed a way to transport its products. Rockefeller saw the plight of the railways. They were overbuilt and lacked cargo. As a result, he negotiated with the leading railway tycoons for transport rebates through the South Improvement Company in exchange for filling their trains with standards product. Rockefeller was always looking for better and more efficient ways to do things, and as a result, he started using tank cars to transport his product, which was cheaper than transporting by barrels. Together, they purchased a number of newly introduced tank cars. In a single swoop, the huge expense of shipment by barrels had been eliminated. His deals with the railways and the introduction of the tank car enabled Rockefeller to further reduce his costs, thereby improving his profits and expanding his oil empire. However, he was still dependent on the railway companies. As a result, they consolidated some of his highest costs, and he tried to find a way around them. The two largest railway tycoons, Scott and Vanderbilt, see Rockefeller's prosperity rising at their expense and the rivals band together to force Rockefeller to pay normal rates or lose the transportation of his product, a deal which he presumably cannot refuse. However, Rockefeller finds an alternative to his dependency on the railways. He builds pipelines which connect his refineries to both the wells 
and the cities where he can sell his product, rendering the railways obsolete. Basically, he epitomizes what would be called monopolistic practice in the late 19th century, and that eventually would be outlawed, as you know, and would lead to the breakup of Standard Oil. But uh, some of the authors are charitable, and they're looking at him as that, that Rockefeller felt that uh, that uh, consolidating the industry, consolidating the refining of petroleum was the best way to increase efficiency and lower the price of a product, uh, particularly the kerosene for aluminum. So that would be beneficial to the consumers. Uh. Rockefeller formed Standard Oil Trusts in 1882, but after the company was forced to dissolve in Ohio due to antitrust laws, it moved to New Jersey where trusts were allowed. Rockefeller ruthlessly bought up or cut out almost all of his competition. Standard Oil competed with 26 independent refineries in Cleveland. In an event called the Cleveland Massacre, Rockefeller eliminated 22 of the 26 refineries. His end goal was having complete control of all the oil refineries. Standard Oil would eventually control 90% of the refineries in America, or a significant portion of the oil wells, and control sales and distribution of the oil products thereby effectively creating a monopoly of the oil industry. Only a very few clever competitors were able to escape Standard's clutches. John D. came to chiefly rely on only one weapon, price cutting, to drive them out of business. Often it worked, and the wounded came meekly offering the refineries. Equally often it failed, for the independents had flexibility that Standard now lacked. When Standard cut prices to cost or to below cost in a particular area, they respond in a variety of ways. Some searched out a new market and flooded it before the giant knew what was happening. Others simply shut down the refineries and waited until John D. could no longer bear to see the stream of red ink across his ledgers. When the standard raised its prices, they moved back in. Rockefeller was now suffering the consequences of his actions, and public opinion was swaying against him and the monopoly he created. President Theodore Roosevelt and journalist Ida Tarbell pushed for legal action to be taken, exposing John Rockefeller's unjust practices. In 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed, effectively making all monopolies, trusts, or their combinations that restricted trade illegal and required them to be dissolved. The government filed a federal suit against Standard for its violation of the act. John D. Rockefeller kept moving so they could not subpoena him. Finally, Rockefeller agreed to testify, and Standard was tried. In 1911, the Supreme Court finds the Standard Oil in violation of the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act because of excessive restrictions to trade, and in particular, its practice of buying out the small independent refiners of that, of lowering the price in the given region to force bankruptcy of competitors. The court ordered Standard Oil Company to dismantle 33 of its most important affiliates giving the stocks to its own shareholders and not to a new trust. From the offspring will come ExxonMobil, Chevron, American, and Esso. Rockefeller's fortune grew even though the trust was broken up. The breakup increased the value of the companies created as a result of the dissolution of Standard. Rockefeller retired from the day-to-day -day leadership of Standard Oil in 1896. Although he held the title of president, he was strictly a figurehead. Rockefeller retained the values he learned from his mother and his Baptist church preacher, who said make as much money as possible, then give it all away. Despite his cruelty and commerce, Rockefeller was a deeply religious Baptist and the biggest philanthropist of his day. Mr. Rockefeller's benefactions from 1855 to 1934 totaled $530,853,632 of which the greater amount went to the four great foundations he established for the purpose of handling his charities. They were the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Laura Spielman Rockefeller Memorial in memory of his wife, and the General Education Board. The University of Chicago was another large beneficiary. John D. Rockefeller pushed the boundaries of commerce. Tragically, his competitive nature and greed led to the exploitation of small businesses. But in the end, Rockefeller did create a better world for all of us.